Good evening everyone, time for another Bitcoin report. I want to start out with the chart that I posted this morning that seems to indicate that Bitcoin is forming another pennant. There's a couple of things noted here. There's the support line around 900 that I pointed out previously. There's the long-term uptrend line and then there's the top of the resistance line. So let's go over to bitcoinwisdom.com and you can see here that at the current price of 1155 we've got a couple of things of note the first one is going to be the crossover of this moving average here you can see that for the most part if we back out one more to the six hour you can see that the major crossover of the blue line way back here which was the beginning of this bull rally and that was also marked by a crossover of the MACD that pretty much stayed above the green line all the way up until this point here this correction that we have now you can see it's beginning to cross over again and the MACD is approaching a crossover from positive territory you can see the red line in selling the selling is diminishing and the buying is increasing now if we move in just a little bit here we can see what I call a pennant formation that had formed now actually there was more a more perfect pennant formation right here where we were at that 1242 high you can see that the prices got higher and higher we're talking about higher highs and lower lows and the way that that works is really fairly simple what that means is the general sentiment is bullish when people see a pullback in the price they snap up the Bitcoin they buy and so as the price rises those pullbacks become less and less until we finally get a test of the old highs where you can see right here there was virtually no trading at all as far as price action it was only when we had this little tiny sell-off that wasn't met by a lot of buying a little bit of buying which failed to bring us back that's when the big selling come came in and the market started to drift off and then we got the big sell-off put in a bottom spike and the spike itself on that is about a hundred points so that's a pretty big spike so you can see that the pennant is reforming now and you've got that same rising line here where more and more buyers come in as the price dips people buy it up so I'm expecting a test of this 1242 high now I can't say for sure that this pennant is forming up and is going to penetrate on the next test it could do one of these and correct again and form a larger pennant you can see that this pennant back in here took all the way up until this point here in November 26 to actually do the breakout so it was a larger pennant than the one we're looking at it's quite possible that we could go sideways quite a ways before we get that test but we are approaching that test now if we look at Litecoin quoted in US dollars it's even more dramatic you can see we're approaching across of the blue line and the green line the last time that that happened was actually the breakout all the way back down at five dollars the MACD as well has already crossed over so you can see that when Litecoin broke through this downtrend here significantly it corrected a little bit and it took off so Litecoin is running hard it's not back to the old highs which were all the way up at about almost 50 bucks but it is back to about 38 bucks from that low of down around 23 so we're seeing a lot of recovery in the various cryptocurrencies I think we're going to see them all recover once we see Bitcoin go into new highs. Now I wanted to talk about a lot of the arguments that are being bandied about out there. Let me start out first though with this proverb. 
he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. And I am talking specifically about Peter Schiff and Gary North. Now, it's one thing to be ignorant, but when you've had plenty of chances to become educated and you remain ignorant, it may actually be something else. I'll leave that for you to decide. Before we go into the arguments, because we have the open letter from Eric Voorhees, who was on Peter Schiff's show, who pretty much couldn't get a word in edgewise, and then we have the ridiculous article from Gary North, which is debunked by uh, Jeffrey Tucker. Before we do that, let's look at some stories here. I want to look at this retraction by Jay Snips. Now, if you remember, he had done a piece on the alt currencies and had gone all in with Quark coin. Now it appears, after watching my video and some other information, doing some more digging, that he has some doubts. Now, I'm just going to read to you the comments that came in on my video. This is from Danster. He says, I just found out about these quarks, and it's clearly a scam. 98% already mined, and people are buying this? 1% own 98%? What more do people need to know? If there's going to be a genuine complementary currency to the Bitcoin, to Bitcoin, they will need to have at least the same or shorter supply increases to ensure a well-distributed supply. So if you remember with Bitcoin, we had the, I think it was the 10,000 Bitcoin pizza, and Bitcoin from the beginning began to be very well distributed. A lot of people lost a lot of Bitcoins, a lot of people spent a lot of Bitcoins, but before there was really even any purchasing of Bitcoin, before there was a Mt. Gox, there was a fairly wide distribution and there was a very large mining network online. Continuing, and if over a relatively long period of time, say two or three years, that currency has some value, if even only minor, you are likely looking at a successful future currency. If, however, it only recently released and the price has shot up, and especially if it's owned primarily by the developers, you are looking at a classic pump and dump scam. I will predict that those developers holding quarks will be monitoring the internet for sentiment around quarks and as posts like mine here and videos like this start to distribute they will taught that will be time to dump 98 percent on some exchange for BTCs bitcoins a real cryptocurrency please don't fall for this so that's the comment from Danster this is the comment from Josh S Quark is a pre-mined piece of crap. Bill was given heaps of quarks and is now scamming all his loyal followers with this scam. I'm very disappointed with Bill still. He bashes Bitcoin for two years, then wakes up one day thinking, oh, I get it. Instead of saying, okay, Bitcoin is cool, he recommends some pre-mined scam coin. 98% of all coins already mined. Not so he can destroy the global banking elite, but so he can become rich on the backs of his fans. Shame. So those are the reactions. Now, if we look at the 10-day Quark coin chart, you can see that it's retreating. It's down about 50%, although it had a 60-plus percent drop here. It's still falling on low volume. My prediction is that Quark coin is going to collapse and that's based on the fact that it was pre-mined and that it's not in my opinion a true cryptocurrency the way Bitcoin was what the plan is behind it well I think there's a lot of get rich quick schemes out there and that's what people who have been invested in Bitcoin have been accused of being involved with so let's look at those arguments. The first one here is Eric Voorhees' open letter to Peter Schiff. Now, 
I am very disappointed with Peter Schiff. Uh, Peter Schiff, in my opinion, has now become a loudmouth know-it-all. Uh, it's already occurred on other shows on Peter Schiff's radio show. If you listen to the intro, Peter Schiff's show sounds like the Sean Hannity show. I guess Peter wants to become mainstream. I don't know. But a very disappointing show already. And if you listen to the episode with Eric Voorhees on, he pretty much couldn't get a, a word in edgewise. And again, the arguments that Peter threw out were utter garbage, just as the arguments that Gary North makes. So we're, we're looking at economic dinosaurs. It's up to you to determine what their motives are. It's going to be hard to explain it as being either one of two things, either just outright ignorance or malevolence. So it's going to be one or the other. I can't think of another alternative. But let's look at what Eric says here. The fundamentals. First, Bitcoin must always be considered as two things. The payment network, Bitcoin, and the currency units, Bitcoins. Condemnations of the latter can often be resolved with an understanding of the former. Satoshi should have named them differently to avoid this initial confusion. And I wanted to bounce back real, real quick here. If you haven't gone onto the blog or you can find it elsewhere and listen to the original Bitcoin white paper read by uh, Stefan Molyneux you really need to go and listen to that it's about 20 minutes and I had read the paper a number of times but if you sit there and play that and listen to it you really see the genius and the beauty it's uh, it's remarkable the forethought that went into that original white paper I I challenge you to go and listen to that white paper you're going to hear things that surprise you that you can't believe he thought of back then before anything even existed he thought of everything so this in my opinion is going to go down in history as one of the monumental works in economics but let's get back to Voorhees letter here when you suggest that bitcoins have zero intrinsic value you're only considering the currency itself and ignoring the payment network while I prefer the term utility over intrinsic value because all value is subjective to the valuer I may indeed admit that bitcoins as currency units all by themselves have no fundamental utility and are completely uninteresting but and this is absolutely critical the payment network has vast utility in fact this network is probably one of the most valuable and consequential technologies currently on the planet some of us realized this a few years ago. Now, I'll say those of us who realized this a few years ago were the ones who actually bothered to educate themselves about it. It seems that a lot of the critics just simply refused to educate themselves. You know that that's the case because of the tired arguments they trot out that have already been refuted. If you go to the original Bitcoin wiki and the explanation of all the arguments against it everything has been refuted many years ago but they keep trotting out these same old tired arguments others are realizing it now many more will realize it in the future and that is the absolute truth many more will realize it the Bitcoin network is fundamentally a ledger of title controlled by no man ponder that for a moment the transmission of value and ownership has thus just been severed from the state not by impotent voting but by the technological achievement of man now during the show you agreed that perhaps this payment network has utility so if the network bitcoin has utility and only one currency is accepted on this network bitcoins and those bitcoins are scarce then should not those units themselves command a market price who knows what that price should be but there should be a price no and he goes on so let's look at some of the arguments but I'm gonna look at them in this refutation of Gary North by Jeffrey Tucker Gary North is also well respected in the libertarian and 
Austrian schools, but I think he's pretty much shot himself in the foot on Bitcoin. Now, the issue of Bitcoin being a Ponzi scheme, I've already addressed this multiple times, but let's go over it real quick. Given that the market of freely choosing individuals has placed a value on Bitcoin, the burden of proof on North is to show that Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. However, the Ponzi scheme shows that the very definition of a Ponzi scheme does not apply to Bitcoin. There are several key differences between a Ponzi scheme and Bitcoin. First, Ponzi scheme vehicles are inherently fraudulent. When running a Ponzi scheme, the promoters lie to participants and conceal key information about where their funds go. Bernie Madoff, who claimed his firm's consistently high returns were based on investments which he, in fact, never made, is a prime example. The issuance by Alan Stanford of phony certificates of deposit to unwitting customers is another example. In contrast, Bitcoin is not based on fraud or deception. Bitcoin is an open book, literally. The open source model Bitcoin employs means that it cannot claim to be one thing while in fact being another. Anyone is free to inspect the Bitcoin code base to determine for himself what it is and what it is not. This difference alone starkly distinguishes Bitcoin from a Ponzi scheme. The second key difference between Bitcoin and a Ponzi scheme is revealed in Wikipedia's differentiation of a Ponzi scheme and a pyramid scheme. And Bitcoin has been called both of those. A Ponzi scheme requires an operator. In a Ponzi scheme, the schemer acts as a hub for the victims, interacting with all of them directly. Bitcoin is not run by anyone. It is a decentralized system. In Hayekian terms, a spontaneous order. Anyone can mine, buy, or sell Bitcoins. And unlike Charles Ponzi, Bitcoin has no promoter. Now this is one you hear a lot, that there are promoters out there. And uh, it's just not true. There are people who believe in it, very excited about it, but there's no promoter and there's no reason to promote. Uh, people have accused Max Kaiser of trying to pump up Bitcoin and I definitely disagree with his involvement with Quarkcoin. All of these criticisms would be valid about Quarkcoin but not about Bitcoin. There really is no promoting of Bitcoin as far as the ones that I hold or the ones that you hold. You either support the idea or you don't and uh, it, it doesn't really intersect with an individual. Acting as a hub, the creator of Bitcoin are anonymous. Note Bitcoin is capitalized when referring to the software and the network as a whole and uncapitalized when referring to individual currency units. The third difference is this. A Ponzi scheme claims to rely on some esoteric investment approach and often attracts well-to-do investors. In other words, there's some secret. Now, if you look at the South Sea bubble, the Mississippi scheme, many of those uh, bubbles that were covered in Charles McKay's uh, Madness book, you can see that they all, or most of them, had that esoteric investment approach. There was something that other people didn't understand and it was going to be a huge thing and you're missing out if you didn't get involved. The internet NASDAQ bubble was an example of this. If you remember all you had to do to get venture capital was to have a certain number of eyeballs on your site. Those eyeballs could even be caused by robots that you had created yourself and they threw money at you. You didn't have to have a business plan or your business plan could be ridiculous such as uh, web van. I could go through dozens of companies that really didn't even have a business plan but they were on the internet. They had to do with the internet so they were going to make a lot of money. Of course that thing collapsed. Now Bitcoin is the opposite of esoteric. It is open source and all are free to use it at their own chosen level of participation. Computer programmers can read and even modify the source code. Cryptographers can study it, etc. 
North's Ponzi logic. Now that the fundamental premise of North's article has been dispatched, let us address several statements North makes which contain faulty logic or false assumptions. One, North says Bitcoin is made out of nothing. This is a specious argument. The fact is that the Bitcoin currency and payment network is comprised of computer code. Is the web browser you are using to read this article made out of nothing? Now I really want to look at this because this isn't an issue that I've addressed in the past. Software is valuable and if you look at some of the most valuable software out there obviously what I'm using right now Windows is very very valuable Microsoft is one of the most valuable companies in the world Cisco is a company that has software for routers Google is a company that has software now what is the value in software the value in software primarily is the work done by programmers and their interaction with users to develop something that people want and that people use. Is software made out of nothing? Well, in this definition, yes, it is. In essence, there is nothing physical there. Nevertheless, all of the work and the ideas, whether it's a word processing program, whether it's a spreadsheet program, you can even look at uh, the open office suite and the fact that this is a free software system I happen to use it but there's a learning curve involved with open office it's different in some ways than the Microsoft products Microsoft products continue to sell to this day so software is a perfect example and the fact that Gary North could be ignorant of the value of software and use that argument against Bitcoin just shows again that he's an economic dinosaur. The fact is that the Bitcoin currency and payment network is comprised of computer code. Is the web browser you're using to read this article made out of nothing? The Bitcoin is not a physical good doesn't mean it is made out of nothing. Billions of people including North assign economic value to all sorts of things which have no physical form. So that's a specious argument. Number two, North writes, something that was valuable for its own sake, most likely gold or silver, nothing is valuable for its own sake. All value is assigned. This is Subjective Theory of Value 101. North doubtless knows this, but it appears he's attempting to imply gold and silver possess some sort of intrinsic value it may feel good to believe, especially if you own gold and silver, but it's just not true. Gold and silver have many uses, for example, in electronics or silver in water filtration, but most of the value of gold in particular is due to its marketability, meaning the acceptability of gold by other market participants. Now, I wanted to talk about this a little bit. They compare gold and silver and Bitcoin. Now, if you're familiar with the work of FOFOA and the free gold people, they prefer gold. They do not prefer silver. Gold has electronic uses, but for the most part, they're very tiny. Gold is used in jewelry, but I would argue that the use of gold in jewelry doesn't have to do with its beauty as much as it has to do with its value. So if it is the case that the usefulness of a any substance for other uses makes it better money, then you would have to argue that silver is better money than gold. Now, I personally promote silver, and that's not because I believe that silver is better money than gold. I promote silver because silver is very, very rare because the price has been suppressed and there's a tremendous coming shortage of silver. Nevertheless, all throughout history, gold is the number one money and silver is number two. Now, in the modern era where silver has so many uses, if Gary North's argument were correct, then silver would be better money than gold. So you need to think about that. Now. I would argue the opposite, that historically the reason why gold is 
better money than silver, and FOFOA would agree with this, is that the vast amount of gold that has been saved up over many centuries is used exclusively for money. So if we look at Bitcoin, we would have to say that those characteristics that gold possesses are actually possessed even more so by Bitcoin because Bitcoin is money and only money. It can only be money. It cannot be anything else, although some might argue that it can be used as a message system. But for the most part, this argument, if it's true, then silver would actually be better money than gold. So it's not true. Now let's look at number three. North writes, Bitcoins are but Bitcoins are unique. The money was siphoned off from the beginning. Now, as I said, that is true of some, potentially. I suspect it may be true of Quark, but it's not true of Bitcoin. And he counters that argument that early adopters make money off of things. Of course, early adopters make money off of things. They always have. With market money, early adopters have always profited from their foresight. The creators of Bitcoin may be sitting on lots of them. I don't know. But there's nothing unique about that. Early adopters also take lots of risk. The founder of every multi-billion dollar company had mountains of stock at the company's inception. You only need to think about Bill Gates with Microsoft or the founders of Cisco, Google, Facebook, any of the rest. So this is not a rare thing. Number four, North observes money develops out of market exchanges. Yes, and that's what's happening with Bitcoin. People began using it from the beginning knowing it was not money by the Austrian definition as the most widely demanded commodity, yet they kept using it for market exchanges. They could do so because Bitcoin is also a payment system which allows secure peer-to-peer -peer transactions with no third-party fees. That feature in and of itself has great utility. If Bitcoin becomes money by the Austrian definition, it will be because it developed out of countless market exchanges. Number five, when North proclaims Bitcoins cannot serve the consumer, there's nothing to consume, he makes an absurd statement. As if a customer cannot be served without consumption. When was the last time North consumed a gold coin? Never because gold is not consumed. Even if it's made into jewelry, it can be refashioned into coins or any other form. Now that's ridiculous. So there is proof that you're talking about an economic dinosaur. That someone would make such a specious argument uh, shows that they're utterly discredited. Number six, North continues with more nonsensical statements. Quote, but the fundamental characteristic of money is its relatively stable purchasing power. Now this is one we hear a lot and the argument is that Bitcoin is volatile and that therefore it's not a good form of money. Now we know that the volatility of Bitcoin, I can show you the volatility of Bitcoin, it's right here in the chart. Now the traditional definition of volatility is something that goes up and down violently. Now if you look at this chart you do see a correction. There's one off the chart here. You see one volatile period here where we corrected from this 273 all the way down to 50. For the rest of this period the price of Bitcoin was fairly stable. The next instance we're looking at is a tremendous rise in the value of Bitcoin. Now, if you remember in the interview with Eric Voorhees, Peter Schiff asked him, well, what do you get your salary in? Do you get your salary in Bitcoin or do you get your salary in dollars? And Eric admitted that he has a dollar salary and then that's calculated based on the current market price of Bitcoin and he's paid in that. And Peter took that as some kind of victory. Now, my reply would be that I have negotiated a salary, or I would choose to negotiate a salary, that would be paid in Bitcoin, and the agreement would be that it would decrease by whatever set percentage every month. So 
the first month I get 10 bitcoins, the next month I get nine and a half, whatever that percentage is. And as the value of Bitcoin rises, the number of Bitcoins I'm paid in decreases. Now, if you think about that, all I have to do in the first month is save, say, 20% of my Bitcoin. By the time we've reached the next couple of years, that 20% of Bitcoin savings that I had saved would now be more, would be multiples of my entire monthly salary. That's what you get when you have a deflationary currency. Savers are rewarded. That's what we've seen in Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is not volatile. Bitcoin is deflationary. Bitcoin continues to rise in value. This argument about volatility is also specious. Number seven, North goes on to set up a straw man argument framing Bitcoin not as an open source international currency and payment system, but rather as a mania driven pump and dump investment. He writes, quote, whenever somebody tries to sell you an investment that is based on economic analysis of a market, an analysis that cannot possibly be true, do not buy the investment. Now that his monetary theory arguments regarding Bitcoin have failed, he points to the rapid price increase in Bitcoin as evidence that Bitcoin itself must therefore be fraudulent. Perhaps Bitcoin is in a bubble and the price will crash. Maybe it will be overtaken by another cryptocurrency someday. Perhaps the rapid price increase is pointing to an acute worldwide demand for a secure, borderless, person-to-person, -person, expense-free form of of payment. The fact is nobody knows why the price of Bitcoin is what it is right now or what it will be in the future. For North to claim he does and importantly for him to use Austrian economics as the basis for his, his claim is unfounded and misleading. Number eight, a final piece of Northian Ponzi logic masquerading as sound argument. Quote, the mania has destroyed Bitcoin's use as money. Bitcoins are too volatile in price to ever serve as a currency, which is money, dollars, or Bitcoins. The answer is obvious dollars. Now, I've addressed this, and he addresses this as well. The dollar has lost 99% of its value since inception. Against the dollar, Bitcoin has risen 10,000 fold. So the issue is not volatility at all. Anybody for virtually any period of time that you can choose here, if you look at this chart and choose a period of time in here, except for we're on the three day, except for this three day period here and this three day period here and this three day period here, which is about nine days, everyone else who had purchased Bitcoin would be roughly even or eventually at a gain. If we come to the present time, you can see that everyone who has purchased Bitcoin up until today, except for these people right up here between roughly 1187 and 1242, everyone else in the history of the currency who's purchased it is standing at a gain. Now, I don't call that volatility. I call that deflationary currency which gains value. And that is a currency to be desired as opposed to a currency like the dollar which continually loses value over time and we know that fiat currencies all eventually go to zero. So it's very shocking to see as Litecoin and other cryptocurrencies are rising very rapidly in this recovery. I think it's going to continue. It's very shocking to see these economic dinosaurs, I will call them, coming out and making a series of specious arguments against Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. They hold no water. They have no weight. There's no basis whatsoever. If anything, the discrediting of cryptocurrencies will probably be through some type of Trojan horse, perhaps something like Quark, where there is a real pump and dump scheme and a whole lot of innocent people lose a whole lot of money. And we'll talk to you next time.